Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Chapter 9 of Book 3 of his work on anger, Seneca is going to attend very closely to what we nowadays call the mind-body connection. We are physical beings and we do have, you know, whatever you want to call it, a psychical, a mental life as well, but they're not totally dissociated from each other. The mind does in fact, in, at least in some respects, rule the body. But the body and its stresses, its getting tired, its various arrangements and humors, whatever we want to call it, certainly affects the mind. And so there are some things that Seneca thinks somebody who's inclined to anger needs to really attend to so that they don't get angry. Uh, you know, you might even say they don't trigger their anger by allowing themselves to feel lousy or bad in other respects physically, and that then affecting the mind. And he begins by talking about something that we might say, well, that's not really physical as such, but it, it certainly could be. It says, people inclined to anger should give up unusually demanding fields of study, studia graviora, right? these serious, demanding things that we could be devoting ourselves to. And he'll give some examples of this a little bit further down. He says, we ought to avoid the forum, advocacy, the courts, and all pursuits that irritate the vice of anger. Now, going to the court, that's adversarial. The forum, likewise, that's probably going to be not just physically demanding and psychologically stressful, but you're already in a position where you're engaging with other people in ways that are antagonistic, right? So it's easy for anger to arise. But there might be other things that we could study and you know, it might be something that we're not particularly good at and we have to apply ourselves very hard and we get frustrated because it's placing these demands. We don't understand things and then we, we get angry. Or it could just be that by its very nature, even if we are good at it, it is in fact quite demanding. And it's interesting that Seneca a little bit later will use the example of music because you know, depending on how you're studying it and what sort of instrument you're working on, that could actually be a physically demanding or mentally demanding field of study. And so Seneca says they should either give up these fields of study or don't pursue them to the point of exhaustion. Uh, so maybe you could put it out you know, in, in bits and pieces, drips and drabs, as we say. You allot yourself an hour a day rather than spending the entire day on some difficult subject. Or you build up to it, right? So that's some interesting advice right there. What should we do instead? He says, their minds shouldn't be employed on hard subjects, but should be entrusted to the pleasant arts. And he says, let them be soothed by reading poetry and beguiled by legends from history. The goal is a softer and more comfortable mental regimen, right? Uh, molius, which is the softer part, and uh, delicatius quae, right? Uh, more comfortable, more suited to ourselves. This isn't to say that we can't ever approach hard topics, but you get the idea with Seneca. If you're somebody who's irritable, you need to proportionate. You need to measure it. You need, there needs to be times of relaxation as well as times of intensive study. 
And then he does talk about music as an example. He brings up Pythagoras. Pythagoras used to play the lyre to settle his mind when it was upset. And so playing the lyre, if you don't know what that is, it's a stringed instrument. And generally you weren't playing more than one string at a time back then. And it might be nice, soft, um, you know, little melodies or arpeggios or whatever it is that you're going to play. And notice that he says that Pythagoras would play. And, you know, we have other interesting examples of uh, philosophers who used music. You know, I think of, for example, of Thomas Hobbes, much, much, much later in time, in the modern era, whose exercise was singing, exercising his lungs, uh, singing songs. Uh, now, you could also do that in order to calm your mind, right? <clears throat> Depending on what the music is. He will contrast this against um, other kinds of music, and he brings up war horns and trumpets specifically. You know, the, the martial music that is supposed to get people all riled up. And if you think about today's contemporary music, it probably depends significantly on the person. I remember as a teenager and a young adult hearing, because I was a metalhead, I was into classic heavy metal from the 70s and 80s, hearing, oh, that's such angry music, it's going to make you an angrier person. And interestingly, we find out with studies that people who are really into metal are often calmed by it, whereas other people perceive it as riling them up, as frustrating or something like that. But we might say that about many other genres of music as well. What's going to be calming for you won't necessarily be the softest stuff, but Seneca is advocating that. He says certain beguiling songs are conducive to mental relaxation. So whatever the music is going to be, it's still the same point. There's a mind-body connection, and some kinds of music might make us angrier. Other kinds of music might make us calmer. And it's up to us to figure out what those are so that we can actually listen to the right sort of music to calm ourselves down. He also very interestingly talks about colors. And he mentions specifically green. Looking at green objects helps when our vision is all a jumble. And then he goes on and says, some colors calm our glance when it's unsteady, just as the brightness of some others dazzles it, right? And he's going to draw a connection here to studies of things. Uh, some studies give that give pleasure through their capacity for thought when it's sickly. <clears throat> but coming back to the color issue, maybe what we need to do is have color schemes for, you know, our decorations, what we're wearing. We could even like deliberately look at certain images to calm ourselves down, maybe getting out there since we're talking about greenness in nature, if there is some greenness and it's not all dry and drab, although, you know, that can have its own charm as well. Maybe that can have a calming effect on our body and our mind. Then he talks about physical exhaustion. And he's got some very interesting things to say about this. Right? So the, the Latin there is lassitudinem corporis, right? a, a tiredness and exhaustion of the body. We should avoid this. Why? Uh, he says that it uses up whatever is mild and calm, meta placidum, que, uh, and it rouses what is fierce in us. And then he goes on and he says something about bile. Now, this, this has to do with uh, ancient theory of the humors. Uh, anger and irritation was associated with black bile, melancholas, right? So the idea was you, you want to have less of that. If you eat, maybe you can reduce that uh, physical exertion and other stresses on the system tend to promote this. So he says that that's the reason why people whose temper is unreliable, they take some food to balance their bile when they're about to undertake matters of greater moment. Becoming wearied, 
stirs up bile. And then he gives you a few ideas about why this might be the case, none of which are particularly uh, important because we've, you know, when it comes to medicine, we don't really think in these terms anymore. But let's look at what he says. He, he tells us either because it forces all bodily heat into the middle regions, damages the blood and stops the circulation because the veins become overtaxed or because the body, when it's weakened and unsteady, presses its weight on the mind. And he says that's why people worn out by disease or age are more inclined to anger. Now, you know, we don't really buy into these physical explanations anymore, but we have plenty of others, right? Uh, we're being flooded with cortisol or, you know, uh, the, the disbalance in not our bodily humors, but in blood flow and hormones and things like that is disrupting us as well, right? We can go on and on and on with physical explanations. The main point that Seneca wants to make here is whatever is the causal uh, medical explanation, physical exhaustion can make us much more liable to getting angry. And we could also add to this a lack of sleep will often make people quite irritable. And I like this idea of it uses up what is mild and calm within us, right? So, you know, becoming wearied, fatigatio, stirs up this bile, stirs up whatever it is in us that gets us more likely to respond in angry ways. And then he talks about hunger and thirst. Now, this is a very interesting one. He says, we should also avoid hunger and thirst for the same reasons. What do they do? They irritate, exasperate, and inflame, inkedit our minds. That Literally, they make our minds on fire. They, they start a fire or they start a spark in our minds. And so he says, there's an old saying, a tired man goes looking for a fight. And that's equally true of a hungry man, a thirsty man, any man who's galled by anything. It might be somebody who's in chronic pain, right? He says, just as sores hurt at a slight touch and even the mere thought of a touch to the extent. So a mind that's impaired is offended for the slightest reasons to the extent that a greeting, a letter, a speech, a question provoke some people to quarrel, whatever sickly squawks when it's touched. So, you know, hunger and thirst, if we are in a uh, condition where we, you know, skipped lunch, skipped breakfast, uh, we're dehydrated, we're not getting what we need, uh, we're more likely to get irritated. And if we're already people liable to anger, to go down the path, to anger, the things that would normally not tick us off, like he says, you know, uh, a greeting. Somebody greets you. How you doing? You don't care how I'm doing, right? We could go on a letter, a speech, a question. It's not that the person is really angry at that. It's rather that they have this, you know, physical irritant and it makes it so much easier for them to feel anger. So all of these things, to some degree at least, uh, chronic pain may be a bit more difficult to deal with. All these things are, you know, to some degree in our control. Obviously, a lot of people don't have that much choice about the kind of work that they have to pursue through the day and that might make them angry, but many of us actually do have quite a bit of, uh, you know, control and, and ability to prioritize what we're going to do. We can listen to certain music or look at certain colors. We can try to avoid physical exhaustion as much as possible or being overly hungry or thirsty, not just at meal times or when we're going to take a, a little water break or something along those lines. These things, if we pay attention to them and we don't treat our body as if it's just a workhorse for our mind to do whatever the hell it wants with, if we attend to our body, we can keep ourselves from lapsing so easily into anger. 